Very good to be back in Brazil, in Natal, in this beautiful institute. I have a lot of affection for it. Thanks to uh, Alvaro's patience and persistence, this institute has survived the years of the pandemic. Whether it has survived the years of politics is not quite certain, but we really hope that it has. This uh, subject is uh, something that I, I didn't speak about it for many years. In the beginning, it became popular in the 80s, and I gave so many lectures that I, I felt sick. I don't want to think about it anymore. I was doing completely different things. I moved on to different phases in uh, scientific life, um, and these occupied me for a long time. But now I've come back to it for various reasons. Uh, it's become certainly it's popular again, and so I've started uh, speaking about it uh, again. Now, it uh, it's a rather strange subject to speak about because, you know, I'm not reporting the discovery of a different type of galaxy or new X-ray signals or uh, a new type of material or uh, a focused problem like the Riemann hypothesis that uh, we just heard about from uh, uh, Giuseppe. Uh, it, it's really a connecting idea. And uh, these connecting ideas are important. We all like them. We're all delighted when we see connections in different areas. But it's, it's really fundamental. And I want to quote my late uh, colleague, Charles Frank. Physics is not just concerning the nature of things, but concerning the interconnectedness of all the natures of things. And that will be a theme. Now, mathematics will come and go. In this, uh, in this talk, and I don't want you to waste time wondering whether this is a mathematical concept or whether it's a physical concept, because really, at the deepest level, I don't see the difference. Indeed, let me quote uh, Peter Atkins, a theoretical chemist. Determining where mathematics ends and science begins is as difficult and as pointless as mapping the edge of the morning mist. Like many of us theorists, we spend our time walking in and out of this mist. And if I can um, build on something that uh, Giuseppe said in his talk, of course, the aim is understanding. That's not the same as proving, but the difference is not very significant. Feynman said, a great deal more is known than has been proved. I think that's a very deep statement. It doesn't disparage proving. That's a technical task that some, some mathematicians do. You know, there are people who prove and people who don't, and I'm one who doesn't, and Giuseppe is one who, who, who doesn't. But uh, the aim is the same. It's understanding. And all the great mathematicians have actually said, really, we want to have proofs, but what we really are seek is understanding. Okay. Now, um, I'm told, my instructions were, that this talk should be accessible to students. And it's a kind of intellectual sandwich. The first part and the last part are not technical, but in between, there'll be a technical interlude. Right. One more thing before we start. I'll mention a few names during the talk, but not systematically, because near the end, I'll give a timeline of the tangled history of this subject. It's really interesting with many intertwined um, ingredients, but you have to wait for that. There'll be a few names otherwise almost at random. So let's start with prehistory, almost the first geometric phase, almost you'll understand later, was discovered in 1830 in the optics of crystals. Now, of course, we know Hamilton. You, we None of us can write a paper without consider the following Hamiltonian. You know, his name is in our DNA. And uh, he was emphasizing phase space, the idea that you should consider position and momentum, which in many cases is direction, at the same footing. And uh, he, he predicted something using this idea, and it was very natural that it will be in the optics of crystals, because crystals are anisotropic and direction matters, depending on the symmetry class, but still. Um, it, this is textbook stuff now. 
in any in a, a general crystal, two beams of light can travel in any given direction. They have orthogonal polarizations and uh, uh, and different speeds. And uh, the speeds are described by a, a construction that Fresnel invented, the wave surface. It's in direction space. We now would say this is the Hamiltonian in K space for fixed frequency. And uh, what Hamilton understood, which Fresnel had not, is the shape of this surface, here's half of it sliced, uh, for a general crystal where all three directions are different. It depends on the symmetry class. And you see that, that there are two surfaces. The distance from the origin distances give you the refractive indices of the two uh, waves that travel in the, the direction chosen. And Hamilton realized that uh, there are these singularities, these uh, 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 places where the two surfaces meet. And for that direction, the propagation is like an isotropic material. And uh, these are two surfaces intersecting at four points, which are directions on two optic axes, which is why these are called biaxial crystals. OK. Now, and they have the same refractive index in those directions. Now, Hamilton, in a very modern thinking, they thought these are singularities. Let's look at them in detail. These are the characteristic properties of the heart of crystal optics. And each intersection is a double cone, a diabolo. Um, I called these diabolic points for a while because uh, they're the organizing centers of degenerate behavior, as the devil would have it. So they're diabolic. But the shape is also a diabolo, this double cone shape. Um, it's the first conical intersection in physics. It anticipates others in quantum chemistry and condensed matter physics. They all have the same mathematical origin, which we'll get to, degeneracies of something. Now, in condensed matter physics, these are called Dirac points, but no, they should be called Hamilton points because it, you can never change a terminology once established, and there's no way in which I'm disparaging Dirac. He was born close to where I live now, and his little house is uh, now famous uh, because he, he was born there. But uh, he never mentioned a cone, and all of the reasons why we call them Dirac points were actually already in Hamilton in 1830. Now, he thought of a very clever way of seeing optically this the consequences of this cone. He predicted internal conical refraction. Take one of these crystals. Um, aragonite was used. These are difficult experiments, even now, for reasons I won't spend time speaking about. It's another story. Um, and you cut it at right angles on these axes and shine a beam of light in. Well, it, it uh, expands into a cone. It's a slant cone. It doesn't matter why. Um, and then when you get to the other side, it comes out and refracts out into a hollow cylinder of light. And he predicted if you put a, a screen there, you'd see a little ring. Now, again, for reasons I don't want to go into, this created a sensation. It made him instantly famous when it was observed by his colleague Humphrey Lloyd the following uh, year. Uh, first of all, there are two rings, not one. It took some time to... Uh, uh, to understand why, but th th there were two rings. Um, uh, there they are. This is, by the way, this is an experiment uh, th th that I did. I have a little laboratory, and it's it's a long story how I got hold of this crystal and, and, and made measurements. It doesn't matter. Now, what uh, Humphrey Lloyd noticed is that uh, these rings are polarized, linearly polarized, in a way that depends where you are on the ring. And as you go round, the polarization rotates by 180 degrees. So this uh, what was, and for a long time I thought it was, the first geometric phase in physics. It's a phase change, a sign change of pi. Polarizations are eigenvectors of something. And uh, as you go in a path around in the space of matrices, two by two matrices, which from Maxwell's equations uh, uh, that underlies this whole um, phenomenon, uh, you get uh, a, a sign change. Well, at least I thought it was the first. It wasn't, actually. and I'll come to that when I've prepared enough to, to, to make it clear. Okay, phase. Right. Well, don't want to insult your intelligence, but phase the cyclic variable describing a process. So the phases of the moon, the process is the shape of the moon as, you, as it goes through the cycle. And of course, it's naturally described by an angle, phase. Geometric phase, geometry. The geometry is uh, 
goes back to Gauss. It's parallel transport in the presence of curvature. And a way to explain that, I don't have a, a stick. I don't need a stick. Um, imagine you stand at the North Pole and you have a javelin in front of your stick. Okay, and there it is. And you walk down towards the equator. And the rule is you must never rotate this uh, thing about the local vertical. Right, the local vertical is the direction from the center of the Earth. Okay, so down you go, and then you let's go um, east. Uh, 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 let's say ninety degrees doesn't matter. Then you go back. Always the same rule, but when you come back, you're in a different direction. You've turned without ever having rotated. Uh, how much have you turned? Well, it's a solid angle of the path that. Uh, uh, has been made on, on the sphere. So this is parallel transport. It's global change without local change. That's a theme of this talk. You know, the Foucault pendulum is an example. It swings back and forth, but its plane of swing turns as the Earth rotates beneath, driving the local vertical. And uh, from that, you can, uh, uh, you can actually detect your latitude from the amount by which it, uh, it, which it, uh, which it turns. Um, Underlying parallel transport is a deeper idea, and holonomy, that the mathematicians miscall holonomy, historically incoherent but unchangeable. Something returns after a cycle, the position of the javelin or the uh, axis of the pendulum, but something else doesn't return, the orienta orientation of the javelin or the swing plane of the pendulum. I'll give you a couple of examples. You know the cat, you drop her upside down. She has zero angular momentum. No torque acts on her as she falls, so her angular momentum cannot change. But she turns. And the reason she can turn, uh, basically, I mean, it's not, 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 not um, exactly, but almost the same shape, but, wrote, but turned by pi, is because she's not a rigid body. And she can rotate bits of herself, a cycle in the space of shapes, um, after which she's turned without ever having rotated. And there are little models you can make uh, of, of this, where uh, you think of the cat as being of separate parts and what she does, twisting one bit the other. At every moment, never any angular momentum. The separate parts do, but they have opposite. And at the end, uh, uh, at the end she's uh, turned, or even this one, the simplest of all. Um, you bend, you have this spike, spiky thing, bend it, then you twist it, and then you unbend it, and, uh, and there again, uh, you see, turned but never having uh, rotated. Another example, parking your car. You, you, you see a narrow space, a small space, and you reverse park your car. Very often you find, I find, you've done it badly. There's a space between you and the edge of the road, the curb. You then perform a series of maneuvers, a periodic series of maneuvers, they're uh, steering and steering and driving. They don't commute. If they did, you could do all your steering in the garage before you left home. Okay. Well, you perform this series, at the end of which you're slightly closer. The anholonomy is the sideways shift. You find often you have to do many of these maneuvers. Why? Because this shift is a little area in the space of shapes of, of, the sh of steering and driving. And uh, it's an area which means that if you have epsilon space in front of you, you need one over epsilon squared of these maneuvers in order to get where you want to get to. So these are, this is uh, the geometry. Now, the geometric phase combines these two ideas, phase and anholonomy, in the physics of waves. Optical waves, quantum waves, uh, 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 whatever. And the phase is the phase of waves as they oscillate. Just a point, waves is one of the central themata of physics. You see waves in all branches of physics. So it's really important we should understand as much as possible about their distinguishing property. Phase, that distinguishes waves from other ideas. Um, well, the anholonomy is cyclically and slowly, and we come back to slowly near the end, changing the conditions of waves while they're oscillating fast. Now, in light, this will be changing its polarization or the direction of a beam of light. In uh, quantum waves, cyclically changing the forces that act on molecules, atoms, neutrons, electrons, uh, whatever. Now, to distinguish the dynamical phase and the geometrical phase. 
You see, even if you don't do anything, a wave still waves. And that's the dynamical phase. It's just locally, it's the frequency uh, times the time. Uh, more generally, if you do change the conditions, it's the integral of the frequency over time. If you do something slowly, by the time you've come back, it's, it's a long time, it's a large phase. And the geometric phase describes this additional phase, which was unexpected, resulting from changing the parameters on which your system uh, is acted. So you can think of it this way. The dynamical phase answers this question. How long did your trip take? The geometrical phase partly answers the question, where have you been? Okay. Now, you measure the geometric phase by interference. That's one way of measuring it. It's a very natural way. So, for example, in polarization optics, you have an interferometer. Take light, split it into two. Uh, you divide, uh, it, it do, do different things in the two parts. Um, this is just a compensator to get, to get the intensities the same so you get good contrast. But here, um, there's, some, there's a stack of polarizers, and you can do things that uh, change the phase, as I'll describe. Um, and then you get interference fringes um, uh, when you recombine. Now, uh, twisting the polarizers in different ways changes the uh, fringes, shifts the fringes by the geometric phase. Okay, now, um, how, do, how do you measure polarization? You describe it as a point on the Poincaré sphere, very natural way. That too has a long history, how Poincaré came to his... Um, to his sphere, I spent some time going through finding where it first appeared in his uh, in his writing, and it's kind of surprising. It appeared rather late. He used other descriptions of polarization right near the end of his two-volume work on polarization and optics. He, he suddenly uh, he suddenly said, "This is all much simpler if you think of it on a sphere. The northern hemisphere is circular polarized in one direction; the southern hemisphere circular in the other." Um, the equator is linear polarization and general states of polarization, cyclic sequence, which you can, there are ways in which you can specify what you have to do with polarizers, a sequence of them, to produce any sequence of, uh, of, uh, 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 of polarization states. And then there's a theorem, come to it much later, that the geometric phase is half the solid angle that... Uh, that uh, you, you, you've, um, you've traversed. Well, with Susanna Klein, he did some experiments some years ago. Here's an untwisted stack of four polarizers, and here are the fringes. These are kind of kitchen table experiments, just slightly too sophisticated for me as a theorist to be able to do. But the millimeter is the scale. And the prediction in this particular case was that uh, the geometric phase was pi. Here's a stack of four retarders. I'll tell you the difference in a minute. Um, prediction that for this particular case was a pi on three, and indeed it, it works perfectly. What's the difference? Polarizers are projection operators. They block out by decoherence, essentially, inside the, the polarization that isn't permitted. But the other one passes through. Unitaries are transparent materials. They're unitary operators, that's retarders, and the other beam goes off somewhere else you can do things other things with it as you wish very good many many examples of experiments with neutrons atoms electrons the Harnoff bohm effect if you know what that is beautiful example of a geometric phase for electrons good um now i want to go back to what i promised which was really the first geometric phase in physics and this was 1819 now, after Thomas Young convinced people, sometimes with difficulty, that light is a wave, and he realized that this wave has polarization, going back to uh, what, uh, um, uh, uh, oh, 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 stop, uh, uh, um, had been discovered before anyway, um, he, he, Fresnel and Arago studied in enormous detail interference of polarized light, and they came up with five laws of interference of polarization. Things like um, orthogonal polarizations don't interfere with each other. The same polarization, two beams, don't interfere if the beams come from different sources, but they do interfere if the beams come from the same source, as a scalar wave would do. 
so on. Now, these five laws, of them, four of them appear in textbooks. The fifth one hardly appears in textbooks, because they didn't describe it very precisely. One textbook only at the beginning of the 20th century mentions the fifth law in addition to the four, which you see in most textbooks. And, and that's because they didn't describe it very clear. They said sometimes the fringes are shifted by half in some circumstances that we've described elsewhere. It's not a self-contained law. And I, I want to show you two experiments that illustrate this. Mm -hmm. In the first experiment, you take a horizontally polarized beam and split it into two. You rotate one beam by 45 degrees and the other by minus 45 degrees. And then there's a phase shift. You put something in there. It's the phase you're measuring in the interferometer. And then you project them back onto horizontal polarization so they interfere with each other. And you see fringes. Very good. It's one plus cos delta is the, is the fringe uh, uh, contrast. The second experiment is almost the same, except that at the end, you project onto vertical polarization, not horizontal. And uh, then you get one minus cos delta and the fringes are out of phase with each other. So this was an example of the fifth law of interference, not precisely described by Fresnel Arago, but they noticed it. They were brilliant experimenters, really brilliant. They spent several years establishing these laws. Well, we can understand it very easy, easily on the Poincaré sphere because uh, here you go um, horizontal, 45 degrees minus 45 degrees, back to horizontal. You haven't enclosed any area. Phase is zero. Here you go horizontal and then vertical, which is opposite. So we've enclosed uh, uh, at the equator, which is a hemisphere, which has solid angle 2 pi. Half of that is pi. That's the geometric phase. Now, I learned this only a few months ago. There's a very beautiful paper by Oriol Artiega a couple of years ago, a historic paper in which he goes back and points out that uh, um, really they discovered the first geometric phase. It's a special case. It's it's pi, but still, it's a very brilliant, interesting thing. 1819, very good. There may be earlier ones, I doubt it. Um, I want to distinguish geometric from topological. When I first wrote my paper, my colleague, I called it uh, topological phase factors, blah, blah, blah. My colleague, John Hanney, said, you shouldn't do that because it's not topological, it's geometric. So what's the difference? Geometric is if the phase can take any value depending on the path in detail, for example, the solid angle phase. Topological is if the phase is independent of the path, provided it encloses something. In the Haranoff bohm effect, it has to enclose a, a magnetic flux line, or the pi phase enclosing a degeneracy. That's the conical refraction phase, or the, um, uh, the um, uh, Fresnel-Arago phase. Okay, that's a distinction to bear in mind. Now, before I get to the technicalities, I just want to sketch through what I consider to be the deepest application of the topological phase. And this was with Jonathan Robbins. And this was to understand the spin statistics connection. Now, you know the Pauli exclusion principle. And underlying that is that uh, if you exchange two um, uh, uh, electrons, you get a, a sign change. Well, more generally, is any fermions, spin is uh, integer plus a half, uh, you get a sign change. If you exchange bosons, uh, you don't. Now, there's a long history of attempts to understand where this comes from in quantum mechanics, and the standard correct explanation is that you need field theory and relativity, and that uh, goes back to Pauli himself in the 1940s. He thought that uh, this exclusion principle was the deepest application of Einstein's relativity. That was in his Nobel speech, that's what he said. But still, there have been attempts to understand it in ordinary quantum mechanics. It's not a competing explanation, it's an alternative explanation. and. Uh, and what we realize, of course, it applies to identical quantum particles. Of course it does. Now, we, this is a technical business that I won't go into it, but you need a topologically adapted Hilbert space. Because if you want to speak about identical particles and exchanges them, um, and you, you, if the particles really are identical, then if you have two positions, R1 and R2, you must identify in the position space 
R1, R2 with R2, R1. Now, okay, that's interesting, and there's some literature about that. But in addition, you have to identify the spin states. Otherwise, you haven't completely um, identified the Hilbert. And that takes a little bit of technology because you have to use a representation of spin that's different from the usual one. But when you do that, you get this topological phase 2 pi s, where s is integer or half integer. If a half integer, it's a sign change, a multiple of odd multiple of pi, otherwise not. Let's think of it this way. It's a topological phase. I'll explain why. You have two particles, r and minus r, and exchanges r goes to minus r. So here's r, here's minus r, but you have to identify them. And if they're identified, you have to identify them and also their spin states. But what identicalness means, if you identify, it's no longer the sphere, it's the projective plane mathematically. And one way to do that is to say, whenever you go, um, whenever you cross the equator, you ignore the bottom half and you reconnect up on the opposite side. Well, once you've done that, you realize that uh, exchange is a non-contractible loop in that space. And so it's topological. And, uh, and uh, if you incorporate identicalness, it leads to this topological phase. Now, why aren't Jonathan Robbins and I famous for proving the Pauli exclusion principle? There's a reason. The reason is that we have to have this adapted spin space, and we realize later that there are a number of different ways to do it, some of which lead to the wrong spin statistics connection. Now, we realize, we found, that all of these other ways have, that we found have something wrong with them. We call them perverse constructions. But we weren't able to find a proper mathematical characterization which, which would lead inevitably to the first one we thought of, which is very natural. So um, uh, what we now say is that we've contributed to understanding the spin statistics connection. We haven't proved it. And this is a case where proving matters, so, and, and we weren't able to. Good. Now the technical interlude, formulas, right? Think of a Hamiltonian, H, depending on parameters, X, Y, Z. For example, um, in uh, condensed matter physics, these are the components of the block vector in k-space. The Hamiltonian, and uh, depends on these parameters, and consider an eigenstate, the nth one, and you take these parameters around a cycle, okay? Then the geometric phase, is, well, you write it in one of two ways. It's the integral around the cycle of something. Well, something that you integrate around a cycle and get a number is called a one form. Okay, that's, that's it. Or using Stokes theorem, you can replace this by an integral over any spanning surface, places where you haven't been, but the, the, the boundary is, uh, is this circuit. And that's called a two form because it's something when you integrate uh, twice, you get a number. Now, um, uh, this object is very important. It's called the curvature for reasons you'll see in a minute. Um, and you can write it in a different way. You can write it in a way that uh, involves all the other states that you don't transport. Okay. And the point of writing it this way is that it's manifestly gauge invariant. You see, choosing these eigenstates, uh, you, you have an arbitrary phase because they just depend on a particular point of a particular uh, uh, value of the Hamiltonian, uh, the phase undetermined. Well, you can ensure, and you need to in this, that the phase you've applied is the same at the end as at the beginning, but that doesn't guarantee that the geometric phase, the integral, will be independent of what phase you've chosen in between. Well, it is, you can prove it, but it's manifestly the case here because it depends only on these, uh, uh, on, on these uh, um, expectation values of the change of the Hamiltonian, and uh, then the phases cancel, you can see. So that's manifestly gauge invariant. So it's a potentially physical quantity. And by the way, to derive these formulas, you use the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. You come to that a, a little bit later. So that's where the physics uh, uh, comes in, evolution. This is in addition to the, gym, to the dynamical phase that I mentioned. Notice this denominator, uh, difference between the energy of your state that you transport and the other ones, in particular the nearest one. And you can see that when these 
degenerate, if you do have a degeneracy at any point in the cycle or a near degeneracy, the phase is very large. And this is um, like, in its simplest case, it's locally exactly, the, the, the flux of a monopole at the origin. And that's exactly what gives you the curvature. Uh, you can describe the Gauss curvature law in exactly uh, that way. It's a very special case. Good, okay. Now, as I say, monopole singularities, and that's where this solid angle comes from. Now, I want to talk about this uh, curvature, this quantity, and I'm calling it B for a reason that will emerge. So there it is. It's this quantity, this object. Um, it's equivalent to an anti-symmetric second-rank tensor field. And the natural question is, well, what about the symmetric version? Well, uh, it's part of a more general object called the quantum geometric tensor, and which has a symmetric part, which is real, and an anti-symmetric part that's imaginary. And that's the most general Hermitian quantum geometric tensor that's gauge invariant. It doesn't depend on uh, what choice you make for these individual little states that you differentiate. So what's the real symmetry? Well, that's different. This is the quantum metric tensor, different physics. This tells you how far apart two quantum states are. Uh, why? You can measure the difference between two neighboring quantum states by how much their overlap differs from one. If they were the same, their overlap would be one, and they're normalized, of course. Um, so one minus that. Now, when you expand this, this has this Riemannian structure, gij, dxi, dxj. These are the parameter changes. And uh, and, and, and that's why this is called the quantum metric tensor. So if you've been a studi metric, it's been studied before. But this, this is, so there's this connection. Very good. Um, I want to illustrate these mathematical notions for reasons I won't go into detail. You need three parameters. So let them be small x, y, and z. Okay. And then consider four complex Hermitian matrices, n by n. Okay, fix them for the minute. And then uh, you can calculate the curvature as a function of x, y, and z. Um, well, here it is, x and y, for some value where z is 1. We can look in the plane. Here's the, the, the length of the curvature. It's a vector in this case. You get this spiky thing. Well, you think that means we're somewhere near a degeneracy. We'll see it in a minute. What about the metric? Well, the trace of the metric is, is a nice quantity to um, calculate. So it's a scalar. So you have, and here it is. Now, it looks the same, but actually it isn't the same. Right. Now, why is this near degeneracy? Well, there's a theorem. Generally, for Hamiltonians, we don't worry about symmetry. You need three parameters to get a degeneracy. Here I'm only exploring two, which tells me if I would go a little bit further away, change the z, I might see a degeneracy. Indeed, you have to go to uh, 1.3 or some, and then you see this degeneracy, huge number value there. So this theory works. Now, one theme that's come into physics in the last half century has been typicality, genericity, universality, structural stability, different names for the same thing where you find, you ask, what are the typical behaviors of uh, systems? See, previously, um, we asked, what are special cases we can solve exactly? A harmonic oscillator, for example, that's the primal case, Ising model, whatever. Um, but uh, it's a different question to ask in nature, in the wild, when Hamiltonians, let's say, of many different kinds, is there any typical behavior? So we wanted to study, this is Pragya Shukla and me, the statistics of these uh, curvature lengths. If you have uh, random states of these Hamiltonians that depend on parameters, so these four matrices, we let them be members of an ensemble, and we average to find the typical behavior of the, of the um, curvature length, the probability um, distribution, and, 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 and here it is. I say it's part of this theme that's come into physics almost unnoticed. Uh, um, right. Well, here it is. Now, it's different for a technical reason for two by two than for greater than two. Um, it's not exactly the same, even greater, but it, there's a big difference, and then the differences are small. Now, this is a fat distribution. It's a long-tailed distribution. It's one on 
curvature to the five halves. And that comes from scaling and from knowledge of the degeneracies, because degeneracies is where the curvature is big. So the nature of degeneracies tells you the large beha distance behavior. And then the rest, well, for two by two, here it is. It's a distribution you can calculate exactly. And uh, greater than or equal to three, there's a scaling. You have to measure the curvature in terms of the mean curvature, which does depend on the size of the matrix, okay, in a particular way. But then it's this universal function which we calculated in this horrible thing. It uh, took some sweat, actually. Now, these are difficult calculations, and we made one or two approximations, so we needed to test. So what we did for the different cases, we chose 10,000 sample Hamiltonians and uh, experimentally, numerical experiments, actually measured the um, uh, me measured these um, objects. And sure enough, there they are. They don't absolutely perfectly agree, but it's, it's convincing that we didn't make any serious mistakes. So that's the, um, the curvature. What about the metric? The trace of the metric tensor Similar calculations, not, e not exactly the same. There are some technical differences. I'll just show you the result for two by two. Here it is. It's the exact result. Um, it, it goes, um, vanishes as g squared. And just I mentioned that n by n, it g to the, for small values of the, g is the trace of the, of the curvature, uh, uh, case of the, of the metric tensor. It's 3 to 3n minus 4, which means if you've got very large matrices, you vanish increasingly fast near the origin, and for infinite matrices, is uh, e to the minus uh, a number on uh, g, which decays very rapidly, divided by g to the 15 halves, again scaling. So we know a lot about the statistic, the typical behavior of these um, interesting uh, quantities. Right, so that was the technical interlude. Now let's come back. You see, you've got these parameters which you change slowly in time to produce a geometric phase. And you know, it results from you know changing fields, coiled fibers, whatever. But of course, parameters are physical variables as well. You know, there's nothing that acts that can't be acted on. So the system, including its phase, must react back on the uh, uh, on those variables, and we want to understand that. Now, very often it doesn't matter because you know you've got a big bits of laboratory equipment to interfere some neutrons with knobs that you turn. Nobody's going to look at the quantum mechanics of the phase reacting on that big bit of apparatus in your lab. It would be totally insignificant. And it's very natural to just think of these as classical variables that you're changing. But in some cases, you have to consider the back reaction. And such a case is the physics of molecules. Now, why is that? Well, uh, you've got nuclei, which are heavy and slow, and uh, they drive the electrons, which are light and swift. And there's the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, almost universal in quantum chemistry, because it's often too difficult to calculate putting the whole Schrodinger equation for the nuclei and electrons onto a computer. You can do it for simple cases, but often not. So the approximation is this. The nuclei hardly move while the electrons solve their Schrodinger equation. And their quantum energy levels depend on where the nuclei are, and they're a potential that you need, um, uh, 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 a potential depending on position of the nuclei that you then need when you solve the nuclear's quantum mechanics to get the vibration rotation levels to complete the spectrum. Okay, so um, that's the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, but it depends on a separation of time scales which ultimately derives from the separation of masses, 2,000 times more uh, uh, nucleus than for the uh, electrons. But it depends on the separation of times, and that's threatened whenever the electron energies get close. Because when the electron energies get close, transition between them are slow. And especially when they coincide at degeneracies, then the born oppenheimer approximation would break down. But degeneracies are precisely where geometric phases originate. So that's a connection in quantum chemistry. OK, um, here's an example. Um, 
here's a, a conical intersection, energy level as a function of space uh, shape of the nuclei for a three nucleus molecule, for example, sodium three. Going round the equilateral triangle where for reasons of symmetry, some of the states are degenerate. So you go round, okay. Now, as you go around this degeneracy, you get a geometric phase of pi. And it was realized that this must be compensated by a pi minus pi, which is the same, when you do the quantum mechanics of the nuclei, so that the whole wave function of the, of the system is single valued. Otherwise, it's not quantum mechanics. Um, well, when you do that, uh, you, you, you find that it shifts the nuclear levels or su subset of them relevant to this particular set of um, uh, as a cha change of shapes, uh, it proportional to half, three halves, five halves, instead of zero, one, two, a kind of half integer quantization. That's an approximate statement, but it roughly what happens. And this was measured, Delacrotez and Al, uh, uh, others. There are bits of the spectrum that you can't index precisely unless uh, you use this half integer um, uh, assignment, otherwise it doesn't work. So it's, it's really a physical uh, property, this uh, geometric phase. Now, pi is a special case. For reasons to do with time reversal symmetry, it applies in that kind of quantum chemistry. But more generally, the phase which needn't be pi also reacts back on the slow physics that drives it. And uh, this reaction it's the first step beyond Born-Oppenheimer, the first sort of bud of dynamics beyond statics. Um, it depends on the slow variables and proportion of their speed. It's a force of magnetic type. Um, well, this geometric magnetic field that acts on the slow variables is exactly the curvature, is why I call it B. And that reveals the dual nature of that geometric object. Its flux through the cycle gives the geometric phase on the electrons, but thinking of it as a magnetic field uh, acting on the nuclear motion uh, changes, even classically, changes the uh, dynamics of the nuclear and nuclear energy levels, um, vibration, rotation, energy levels, etc. Now, one way, a quick and dirty way to see this is if you have a coupled system, slow and fast, slow P, slow X, position, momentum and position, and some fast Hamiltonian, okay, then uh, the fast eigenstates you calculate by fixing the, uh, fixing the uh, positions, freezing them, and then you get uh, the eigenstates of this fast Hamiltonian, and this, um, these energies, depending on position, are the Born-Oppenheimer energies, okay. Um, but you can get an approximate slow Hamiltonian by simply taking the expectation value of this Hamiltonian over the fast state n that uh, you're, you're considering. But when you do that, of course, you must realize that P is minus IH grad, so it affects the position dependence of these states. And going through all of this, um, you find uh, here's your slow Hamiltonian, and it's the following. The P squared and the E, that's Born-Oppenheimer. The A is a magnetic gauge potential, whose curl is a magnetic field, and that's the one form. So the curl of that is the two form. It's the thing I called the curvature. And uh, this phi is an additional force that comes from the uh, metric tensor, the geometric metric tensor. It's, it's all consistent with what you expect, although it's an approximate w w assignment. By the way, one feature of this uh, uh, of this um, scalar potential from the from the uh, metric is that it's repulsive near degeneracies, so they, it tends to act to protect the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. It's a good thing. Okay, uh, it's really universal how chemists almost unthinkingly um, use the Born-Oppenheimer. My, my grandson, for example, just finished a PhD in quantum. Uh, uh, computational quantum chemistry, and he was proudly said he used density functional theory, exact Schrodinger equation. I said, what do you mean exact Schrodinger equation? Did you use Born-Oppenheimer? Oh, of course. You know, with, almost without thinking, they, they use it. But it's threatened in these situations I'm describing. Now, here's an example of geometric magnetism, which is what I'm calling it. You, you have light and a coiled ray. And the coiling describes the polarization. And when the direction at the end is the same as at the beginning, it's the tangent to the path, which um, 
is relevant, then uh, uh, you have a different polarization. It's a solid angle through which your tangent has rotated on its sphere as you go through. Okay, but the polarization is parallel transported along the ray. Okay, and uh, uh, but um, geometric magnetism shifts the ray sideways, and if the if it's an optical fiber and it's free to move, it'll shift slightly, and uh, and and that was observed. So that's an example of the geometric um, mag geometric magnetism. It has different names because it's been discovered in different contexts: a spin orbit effect of light, optical Hall effect, optical Magnus effect, all the same geometric magnetism. Good. Um, now this you learn something from this mutuality, which is really important. This driving of the fast by the slow and the reaction of the fast back on the slow, it reveals that the geometry phase is an artifact. It's a consequence of our decision to take a system of more than one part, let's say two, and consider the two parts separately, rather than think of the system as a whole. Now, so it's an artifact of that uh, decision. Now, if you would treat the electrons and the nuclei and the molecule on an equal footing and put the whole lot on a computer, you could calculate the uh, compute, the energy levels of the molecule, the uh, reaction rates, and other relevant quantities, without ever thinking about the geometric phase. So you might think, well, is it really useless if it's an artifact? No, because treating a molecule as a whole is computationally virtually impossible. So separation into parts is a useful artifact, an approximation. More than that, uh, if you're exploiting this heavy light discordance, you lead to a, it leads to a physically understandable picture of what the molecule is doing. But even more fundamentally, this was emphasized by Isaac Newton, you know, separation is fundamental to science. You know, he, Newton said, you know, if you, if you try to explain the whole universe in one go, uh, it, it's idle. You never make any progress. You understand this and you ignore that and you slowly make progress. Well, sometimes you need to consider a little bit what that is. The, it, it's this big world of system environment problems. Sometimes the environment is perturbative. Sometimes it produces decoherence. Here, it's slow. So there's each have their different character, these different types of environment system separation. Now, the separation is an approximation. The geometric phase is an approximation for driving slow compared with the uh, fast oscillations. And geometric magnetism is the first step beyond Born-Oppenheimer. So what about going further? Well, both the phase and the forces of reaction would involve infinite series of corrections. Now, we understand those uh, corrections for the geometric phase in terms of the slowly changed environment, different derivatives, time derivatives, etc. Et and I, I, I found that in, in the 1980s. Um, but much more difficult is uh, understanding the reaction forces. And we only know a few of them, and they're actually complicated to calculate beyond geometric magnetism. Now, these series almost certainly diverge. Not worried by that because um, most series in physics diverge. I mean, you learn about convergent series in, 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 in high school and university, but they're rare things. Series mostly diverge, and there are reasons for that, which is another lecture. Um, but here, this divergent casts doubt on how strictly you can separate fast and slow, even in classical physics. Why is it hard? Um, I'll explain why the reaction forces are harder. Um, we, the corrections involve derivatives of the driver. Think, think classically. But the slow dynamics should uh, give the forces, the accelerations, as a function only of position and velocity. But here you've got forces that depend on these high derivatives. So you have a quite a complicated system of back substitution, which is extremely hard to, to calculate. And there's a key concept. I don't have time uh, to, to, to go into it. Right, so, so this is a hard problem. It's an unsolved problem at the moment. Now I come to this geometric phase timeline that I promised. Um, 1819, Fresnel and Arago, the pi phase in interferometry. I talked about it. 1831, Hamilton Lloyd, the pi phase in conical refraction. I talked about that. 1924, Bortolotti showed that Maxwell's equations imply that parallel transport 
The polarization is parallel transported along a curved ray. This was rediscovered by Ritoff in 1938, parallel transport. His student, Vladimirsky, pointed out that uh, if you could have a ray that came back to the same direction, this parallel transport would imply that uh, you would have a, the polarization would have rotated. That's the spin redirection phase. He said, I don't know how to make a ray do this, but he didn't have optical fibers. But so many decades later, after the geometric phase, um, uh, uh, people realized that you could coil optical fibers, you could measure this thing, that was done. Okay, so that's them. 1956, Pancharatna, very important nephew of, brilliant nephew of the brilliant uh, and awkward, difficult scientist, C.V. Raman. Um, he realized that a disgracefully young age that uh, he understood as what we would now call geometric phases a solid angle for two state systems in the context of polarization optics so he imagined a ray traveling straight that's not the coiled ray and uh, a series of polarizing elements that brings the person back to the same as before and he realized there'd be a phase change and it was a solid angle Brilliant, very, very important, underlies what I described before. It's a special case for two-state systems in the context of, uh, of polarization optics. 1958, Longnut Higgins, Price, Erpick and Sack, the first step beyond Bourne Oppenheimer, they realized, and they were in Bristol before I was there, that uh, a pi phase of the electronic states involves a implies a modification of the nuclear energy levels very important discussion. Um, also, a year later, Aharonoff and Bohm, they were in Bristol. No, no suggestion they ever realized that they and he were essentially looking at aspects of the same phenomenon. Um, they found the geometric phase, as we now would call it for electrons, from an inaccessible line of magnetic flux. Your electrons essentially go round and, they, and you get uh, a phase that you could detect and did detect by interference. 1975, totally different area, Button and Smith, radio wave propagation in the ionosphere. Polarization state, of course, matters. Um, it's a plasma uh, to some extent. Um, and they realized that if you want to calculate the interference important in, in, in radio between uh, rays that go along different paths and then meet, you need to calculate the phase. They called it phase memory. But then they found there's an additional thing. They call it additional phase memory. And that's exactly the one form of the geometric phase as we now understand it, that you need to integrate to correctly get the phase interference. Beautiful work. Um, 1979, Mead and Troulard generalized what Long and Higgins et al. had done, this pi phase in quantum chemistry. And they understood what we now call the two form, the curvature, the electrons act as a magnetic force on the nuclear motion, that geometric magnetism, they, they realized that. Then my paper, which I wrote in 1983, it was published a year later, um, I realized that uh, this phase occurs very generally in slowly driven quantum systems. It comes out of the Schrodinger equation. Um, and I emphasize the importance of circuits and uh, degeneracy in the underlying two form. And uh, because Mead and I hadn't thought about circuits and cycles. And as I say, it naturally comes from the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. I was completely ignorant of all this earlier literature. It had a, a different history, how, how I came to find it. Um, 1983, again, there's Barry Simon, after I told him, showed him my preprint, made the mathematical connection with the quantum Hall effect, fiber bundles, churn class, all of that. Uh, uh, mathematics. Um, 1984, Wilczek and Z realize that there's a counterpart of the geometric phase. If you have a state that's degenerate and because of symmetry remains degenerate, let's say n degenerate states as you go around a cycle in parameter space, and then what comes back is a little n by n matrix, um, phase uh, unitary matrix, which you can calculate, and that's the generalization of the geometric phase when you have degenerate states that as I say, you take around a cycle. My colleague John Hannay in Bristol realized uh, that if you have um, non-chaotic classical motion, integrable motion, there's a classical analog of the geometric phase in action angle variables. The Foucault pendulum is an example corresponding to the quantum phase. 
Aharonov and Anandan remove the slowness restriction by pointing out that what really matters is that the state comes back. Slowness was a way of guaranteeing it comes back, the more accurately, the slower you take the uh, system. But they realize you don't need that. You could look in the projective Hilbert space, as they called it. Very important development. But for a long time, I was skeptical because they didn't describe a way to do it. They said, all right, just let's let's let this state return exactly. And here's the geometric phase. Um, there wasn't a clear definition of the two form either. It was a one form. But later, I came to understand in a completely different context that there is a way of driving a quantum state in such a way that you have a set of energy levels of a Hamiltonian eigenstates that you never get any transitions between them. And you do that by driving the system with a slightly different Hamiltonian from the one whose eigenstates you're transporting, but you can do it. And this came up in the context of laser cooling, quite different, um, quite different area, area of physics. But that reinstates, in my mind, what Haranoff and Andan uh, did. It described what you have to do to make a state return. And there's some interesting technicalities about that. Um, Jonathan Robbins, my postdoc, also in Bristol, Classical anthelonomy for chaotic systems. We generalized what John Haney had done. Also, this work on the spin statistics. Um, my current colleague, Pragya Shukla, in, uh, in India, um, we've studied these high order reactions beyond von Oppenheimer. It's not, a, it's not a solved problem. We found a model where we, with great difficulty, calculate a number of them um, but uh, and, and see that the series appears to diverge factorially, but it's very far from a proper theory. And more recently, the statistics of the curvature and the metric. So in terms of all this history, what do we call this damn thing? Well, it's common in physics, uh, all mathematics, to name something after people. So you could call this the... Um, Frenel, Agro, Hamilton, Lloyd, Bortolotti, Ritoff, Vladimirsky, Pantaratnam, Loggett, Higgins, Price, Erpik, Sack, Aharonoff, Bohm, Budden, Smith, Mead, Trular, Berry, Simon, Hane, Wilczek, Z, Aharonoff, Anandan. Phase. Well, take your pick. I mean, I tend to prefer descriptive nomenclature, which is why I've always called it the geometric phase. Lots of applications. I'm not familiar with them. I mean, my current work is in different areas. Um, one I particularly like, though, is the geometric phase of the stomach. You see, uh, this is work with um, uh, 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 Julian uh, Cartwright and others. What does your stomach do? It, well, it mixes the food, which is more or less liquid by then. In many circumstances, liquids that have rather low Reynolds number. Well, you don't have a food mixer in your stomach. You change the shape of the stomach, but uh, you don't have a food mixer with, 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 that goes round and round. And you can't mix a, a, a viscous fluid by a process which deforms the stomach and then undeforms because that encloses no area, there's no mixing. So you have to have a cyclic change of shapes of the Hamilton. They have models of all this, um, which uh, uh, they describe. So that's a conjecture that uh, this is how the stomach mixes the food. And they took uh, up my suggestion that uh, they should call this the belly phase. And so now, now they do. Okay, good. Now, just to finish, back to the beginning. I want to show you an easy way to see Hamilton's uh, cone and its geometric phase. This is do-it-yourself conoscopy, and this was with Susanna Klein and Rajendra Bandari. Um, you know, I said, traveling through the crystal, these two waves actually get out of step because they travel at different speeds. And you can make them interfere with a black light sandwich. This is something that uh, geologists use to identify mineral specimens, but I, I want to explain. So the bread of the sandwich is two sheets of uh, Polaroid, polarizing filter, opposite direction. So if it was a poor person's sandwich with nothing inside, it would be black. Right. OK. But what do you put inside? Now, what we would like would be to have one of these... Um, biaxial crystals, but it's very hard to get, even now, to get substantial um, uh, samples of them. But there's something else that um, we all remember, those of us who are old enough, uh, that has the same property, biaxial property, and that's overhead projector transparency foil that we used to use to pr project our lectures. We lived for years writing our transparency, not realizing that they're biaxially 
uh, anisotropic. When I asked my polymer colleagues, they, they immediately said, oh, yes, it must be the case, because they didn't realize it, but they thought it's because of how they're made, symmetry is broken. Almost any kind. Many of us have got uh, boxes of these old transparencies that we never use anymore. Well, what do you do with it? Well, you just look. You just make put it, the, 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 the filling in the sandwich, and you just look through it. See, what's looking? Looking is taking light that comes from different directions, and light that comes in different directions will inside that biaxial material undergo different phase shifts so you'll then see interference when you project with the final polarizer so you just go out in the garden uh, by the physics department in bristol and you look up and this is what you see and just no nothing uh, fancy you just to put a camera there and you you have to move it around a bit so um to, to see the structure. So what is it? You see, the fringes are contours of the separation of the cones. And they're centered on one of these conical intersections, which is why you have to change the orientation to, to, to a little bit. It takes seconds to do it. Very good. Now, this black stripe is the geometric phase of pi. If the phase were 2 pi, as it is for a uniaxial material where one direction is distinguished and the other two are the same, those two conical points have come together and they kiss, they osculate, they touch instead of being conical. Then you get a cross, and that's what how mineralogists distinguish different crystal symmetries. Um, so that's directly you're seeing the geometric phase. One little thing I, I can't resist saying is that every point in this picture, every direction, can be represented by a two by two matrix. Electric field EX and EY comes into the sandwich. Electric field EX, EY comes out of the sandwich. Therefore, they're related by a little two-by-two two matrix, different for different points. All of these matrices have the property, it's very useful in teaching, that they're non-trivial square roots of zero. For a number, the square root of zero uh, is just zero. But you can have uh, matrices A, B, C, D, multiply A, B, C, D, which give you zero, 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 zero. And for a reason you can guess, all these matrices from the black light sandwiches are of this type. Well, you can go to many places. Here's uh, the west of Ireland, the little town where Stokes was born, the Stokes parameters. He taught us one way to measure polarizations. They related, of course, to the Poincaré sphere now, looking across the Atlantic. And um, I thought that was the end of the story. But then I had a lovely email from two Dutch astronomers who had seen this structure in the sky through the windows of a train in the Netherlands. There we are, Hans Bach and Franz Snick. They saw this. Now, what's happening? Well, where's the sandwich? The first polarizer is the blue sky. Air molecules polarize initially unpolarized sunlight. It's a consequence of transversality, very fundamental thing. Um, and uh, the polarization is strongest in the direction 90 degrees uh, away from the sun. So uh, 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 you look away from there. And uh, so that's the first polarizer. I want to speak about that. You see, it was Lord Rayleigh who, uh, who understood uh, this uh, polarization of the skylight. And uh, I had the privilege in 2019, just before the pandemic, uh, being invited to his laboratory. Now, he was one of the rare scientists who was a member of the British aristocracy before, indep be independently of his science. He came from a wealthy family, Lord, so he was Lord Rayleigh. And uh, this is where he lived, not a bad place. And uh, he converted this uh, to his uh, laboratory. He died in 1919. It was unchanged in 2019. A number of us were invited to go and see. And uh, I, I held in my hand his original handwritten manuscript on the polarization of the skylight and the blue color of the sky. Very beautiful, major thing. Well, that's him. But what about the, the rest of the sandwich? The biaxial crystal is the, actually the window of the train because the windows of trains also got, are stressed 
Um, so, and this is because if there's an accident and the and the window breaks, it doesn't break into sharp splinters. It breaks into little blunt cubes. So it's stressed. This stressing means it's biaxially anisotropic. Good. That's the filling of the zone. What about the final polarizer? Well, like any good scientists, they carry polarizing filter in their pocket and they just hold it up and look through and there you see this thing now i've seen it with my colleague mark dennis through um, an airplane uh, window and um, i wanted to see if you could see it from british trains and and, and there you can there it is um stop <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>